yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening. <clears throat> Is this thing on? <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the Fiction Fantastic Players production of Barney the Vampire. <laughs> At this time, we invite you to turn off all cell phones, tablets, and other electronic devices. Please be aware that the bathrooms in this venue predate the invention of color television. Therefore, we kindly request that you not flush anything. Breaking announcement that tonight's performance, the leading role of Charles Holland, will be played by Mo Lester. Enjoy the show. Okay. Is it off now? Yeah. Barney the Vampire. Oh, look at the baby Chapter 16 The meeting of the lovers in the garden. An affecting scene. The sudden appearance of Sir Francis Varney. Our listeners will recollect that Flora Bannerworth had made an appointment with Charles Holland in the garden of the hall. This meeting was looked forward to by the young man with a variety of conflicting feelings, and he passed the intermediate time in a most painful state of doubt as to what would be its result. The thought that he should be much urged by Flora to give up all thoughts of making her his was a most bitter one to him, who loved her with so much truth and constancy, and that she would say all she could to induce such a resolution in his mind he felt certain. But to him, the idea of now abandoning her presented itself in its worst aspects. Shall I, he said, sink so low in my own estimation, as well as in hers, and in that of all honorable-minded persons, as to desert her now in the hour of affliction? Dare I be so base as actually, or virtually, to say to her, Flora, when your beauty was undimmed by sorrow, when all around you seemed life and joy, I loved you selfishly for the increased happiness which you might bestow upon me. But now the hand of misfortune presses heavily upon you. You are not what you were, and I desert you? Never, never, never! Charles Holland, it will be seen by some of our more philosophic neighbors, felt more acutely than he reasoned. But let his errors of augmentation be what they may. Can we do other than admire the nobility of soul which dictated such a self-denying, generous course as that he was pursuing? Hmm? As for Flora, heaven only knows if at that precise time her intellect had completely stood the test of the trying events which had nearly overwhelmed it. The two grand feelings that seemed to possess her mind were fear of the renewed visit of the vampire and an earnest desire to release Charles Holland from his repeated vows of constancy towards her. Feeling, generosity, and judgment all revolted holding a young man to such a destiny as hers. To link him to her fate would be to make him, to a real extent, a sharer in it. And the more she heard fall from his lips in the way of generous feelings of continued attachment to her, the more severely did she feel that he would suffer most acutely if united to her. And she was right, the very generosity of feeling which would have now prompted Charles Holland to lead Flora Bannerworth to the altar, even with the marks of the vampire's teeth upon her throat, gave an assurance of a depth of feeling which would have made him an ample haven in all her miseries, in all her distresses and afflictions. What was familiarly in the family at the hall called the garden was a semicircular piece of ground shaded in several directions by trees and which was exclusively devoted to the growth of flowers. The piece of ground was nearly hidden from the view of the house and in its center was a summer house which at the usual season of the year was covered with all kinds of creeping plants and exquisite perfumes and rare beauty. All around too bloomed the fairest and sweetest of flowers which a rich soil and a sheltered situation could produce. 
Alas, though of late many weeds had straggled up among their more estimable floral culture, for the decayed fortunes of the family had prevented them from keeping the necessary servants, to place the hall and its grounds in a state of neatness, such as it had once been the pride of the inhabitants of the place to see them. It was then in this flower garden that Charles and Flora used to meet. As may be supposed, he was on the spot before the appointed hour, anxiously expecting the appearance of her who was so really and truly dear to him. What to him were the sweet flowers that there grew in such happy luxuriance and heedless beauty? Alas, the flower that to his mind was fairer than them all was blighted, and in the wan cheek of her whom he loved, he sighed to see the lily usurping the place of the radiant rose. Dear, dear Flora, he ejaculated, you must indeed be taken from this place which is so full of the most painful remembrance. Now, I cannot think that Mr. Marchdale somehow is a friend to me, but that conviction, or rather impression, does not paralyze my judgment sufficiently to induce me not to acknowledge that his advice is good. He might have couched it in pleasanter words, words that would not, like daggers, each have brought a deadly pang home to my heart. But still I do think that in his conclusion he was right. A light sound, as of some fairy footstep among the flowers, came upon his ears, and turning instantly to the direction from whence the sound proceeded, he saw what his heart had previously assured him of, namely, that it was his Flora who was coming. Yes, it was she, but ah, how pale! How wan, how languid and full of the evidences of much mental suffering was she. Where now was the elasticity of that youthful step? Where now was that lustrous beaming beauty of mirthfulness which was wont to dawn in those eyes? Alas, all was changed. The exquisite beauty of form was there, but the light of joy, which had lent its most transcendent charms to that heavenly face, was gone. Charles was by her side in a moment. He had her hand clasped in his, while his disengaged one was wound tenderly around her taper waist. Flora, dear, dear Flora, he said, you are better. Tell me that you feel the gentle air revives you. She could not speak. Her heart was too full of woe. Oh, Flora, my own, my beautiful, he added in those tones which come so direct from the heart and which are so different from any assumption of tenderness. Speak to me, dear, dear Flora. Speak to me if it be but a word. Charles was all she could say, and then she burst into a flood of tears, and leant so heavily upon his arm that it was evident, but for that support she must have fallen. Charles Holland welcomed those, although they grieved him so much that he could have accompanied them with his own, but then he knew that she would be soon now more composed, and that they would relieve the heart whose sorrows called them into existence. He forbore to speak to her until he found this sudden gush of feeling was subsiding into sobs, and then in low, soft accents, he again endeavored to breathe comfort to her afflicted and terrified spirit. My Flora, he said, remember that there are warm hearts that love you. Remember that neither time nor circumstance can change such endearing affection as mine. Ah, Flora, what evil is there in the whole world that love may not conquer, and in the height of its noble feelings laugh to scorn? Oh, hush, hush, Charles, hush. Wherefore, Flora, would you still the voice of pure affection? I love you surely, as few have ever loved. Ah, why would you forbid me to give such utterance as I may to those feelings which fill up my whole heart? No, 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 Flora, Flora, wherefore do you say no? Do not, Charles, now speak to me of affection or love. Do not tell me you love me now. Do not, Charles, now speak to me of affection or love. Do not tell me you love me now. 
do not tell you I love you. Oh, Flora, if my tongue with its poor eloquence to give utterance to such a sentiment were to do its office, each feature of my face would tell the tale. Each action would show to all the world how much I loved you. I must not now hear of this. Great God of heaven, give me strength to carry out the purpose of my soul. What purpose is it, Flora, that you have to pray thus fervently for strength to execute? Oh, if it savor aught of treason against love's majesty, forget it. Love is a gift from heaven, the greatest and most glorious gift it ever bestowed upon its creatures. Heaven will not aid you in repudiating that which is the one grand redeeming feature that rescues human nature from a world of reproach. Flora wrung her hands despairingly as she said, Charles, I know I cannot reason with you. I know I have not power of language, aptitude of illustration, nor depth of thought to hold a mental contention with you. Flora, for what do I contend? You, you speak of love, and I have ere this spoken to you of love unchecked. Yes, yes, before this. Now, wherefore not now? Do not tell me you are changed. I am changed, Charles, fearfully changed. The curse of God has fallen upon me, I know not why. I know not that in word or in thought I have done evil, except perchance unwittingly. And yet, the vampire, let not that affright you. Affright me, it has killed me. Nay, Flora, you think too much of what I still hope to be susceptible of far more rational explanation. By your own words, then, Charles, I must convict you. I cannot, I dare not be yours, while such a dreadful circumstance is hanging over me. Charles, if a more rational explanation than the hideous one which my own fancy gives to the form that visits me can be found, find it and rescue me from despair and from madness. They had now reached the summer house, and as Flora uttered these words, she threw herself onto a seat, and covering her beautiful face with her hands, she sobbed convulsively. You have spoken, said Charles, dejectedly. I have heard that which you wish to say to me. No, no, not all, Charles. I will be patient then, although what more you may have to add should tear my very heartstrings. I... I... I have to add, Charles, she said in a tremulous voice, that justice, religion, mercy, every human attribute which bears the name of virtue, calls loudly upon me no longer to hold you to vows made under different auspices. Go on, Flora. I then implore you, Charles, finding me what I am, to leave me to the fate which it has pleased heaven to cast upon me. I do not ask you, Charles, not to love me. Tis well. Go on, Flora, because I should like to think that although I might never see you more, you loved me still, but you must think seldom of me, and you must endeavor to be happy with some other. You cannot, Flora, pursue the picture you yourself would draw. These words come not from your heart. Yes, yes, yes. Did you ever love me? Charles, Charles, why will you add another pang to those you know must already rend my heart? No, Flora, I would tear my own heart from my bosom ere I would add one pang to yours. Well, I know that gentle maiden modesty would seal your lips to the soft confession that you loved me. I could not hope the joy of hearing you utter these words. The tender devoted lover is content to see the truthful passion in the speaking eyes of beauty. Content is he to translate it from a thousand acts which, to eyes that look not so acutely as a lover's, bear no signification. But when you tell me to seek happiness with another, well may the anxious question burst from my throbbing heart of, Did you ever love me, Flora? Her senses hung entranced upon his words. Oh, what a witchery is in the tongue of love. Some even of the former color of her cheek returned as forgetting all for the moment, but that she was listening to the voice of him, the thoughts of whom had made up the daydream of her happiness. She gazed upon his face. His voice ceased. 
To her, it seemed as if some music had suddenly left off in its most exquisite passage. She clung to his arm. She looked imploringly up to him. Her head sunk upon his breast as she cried, Charles! Charles, I did love you. I do love you now. Then let sorrow and misfortune shake their grisly locks in vain, he cried, heart to heart. Hand to hand with me. Defy them. He lifted up his arms towards heaven as he spoke, and at the moment came such a rattling peal of thunder that the very earth seemed to shake upon its axis. A half-scream of terror burst from the lips of Flora as she cried, What was that? Only thunder, said Charles calmly. It was an awful sound, a natural one. But at such a moment when you were defying fate to injure us. Oh, Charles, is it ominous? Flora, can you really give way to such idle fancies? The sun is obscured. Aye, but it will shine all the brighter for its temporary eclipse. The thunderstorm will clear the air of many noxious vapors. The forked lightning has its uses as well as its powers of mischief. Hark! There again! Another peal, of almost equal intensity to the other, shook the firmament. Flora trembled. Charles, she said, this is the voice of heaven. We must part. We must part forever. I cannot be yours. Flora, this is madness. Think again, dear Flora. Misfortunes for a time will hover over the best and most fortunate of us. But like the clouds that now obscure the sweet sunshine will pass away and leave no trace behind them. The sunshine of joy will shine on you again. There was a small break in the clouds, like a window looking into heaven. From it streamed one beam of sunlight, so bright, so dazzling, and so beautiful, that it was a sight of wonder to look upon. It fell upon the face of Flora. It warmed her cheek. It lent luster to her pale lips and tearful eyes. It illumined that little summer house as if it had been a shrine to some saint. Behold, cried Charles, where is your omen now? God of heaven, cried Flora, and she stretched out her arms. The clouds that hover over your spirit now, said Charles, shall pass away. Accept this beam of sunlight as a promise from God. I will. I will. It is going. It has done its office. The clouds closed over the small orifice, and all was gloom again as before. Flora, said Charles, you will not ask me to leave you. She allowed him to clasp her to his heart. It was beating for her. And for her only, you will let me, Flora, love you still? Her voice, as she answered him, was like the murmur of some distant melody the ears can scarcely translate to the heart. Charles, we will live, love, and die together. And now there was a rapt stillness in that summer house for many minutes, a trance of joy. They did not speak, but now and then she would look into his face with an old familiar smile, and the joy of his heart was near to bursting in tears from his eyes. A shriek burst from Flora's lips, a shriek so wild and shrill that it awakened echoes far and near. Charles staggered back a step, as if shot, and then in such agonized accents as he was long indeed in banishing the remembrance of, she cried, The vampire! The vampire! Barney the Vampire, or The Feast of Blood, a romance of exciting interest. Chapter 16 has been spoken to this day by Edward E. French. A copyright exists on all recordings issued by Edward E. French. Inquiries should be addressed to email edwardfrench06 at hotmail.com. Thank you for listening. Good night.